It's one of the most productive distributed meeting I've ever had. Right. So with that, I'm going to call Julian on stage and let him talk about how he's changing the world one school at a time. Thank Thanks, you. Julian. title for you and you'll see at the end. Uh, this, is, this is the world as of 2010. We have 6.8 billion people in 2010. It's now about 7.2. Uh, you'll see that Indian scores number two, Kenya 32, Tanzania 30, blah blah blah, Chile 61. Little blobs are where I'm running projects at the moment. Uh, and that's up from three when I came to India two months ago. So we're now in seven countries. So how did all this start? Well, I went to Kenya. Uh, as Naresh says, I speak at conferences, occasionally conferences give me money, this one doesn't, but never mind. And I gave the money to a little project in Western Kenya, a friend of mine ran, and I trust him basically. So I just said, spend this time you see fit. He ended up building a couple of classrooms with the money and kept saying, come and see what I'm spending your money on. I was busy, I was travelling, I was working for these fancy companies like Google and eBay, didn't have time for all that. But finally I went out there in October 2012, so just over two years ago, and I went and cut the ribbon. You know what that's like, you know, children sing, you cut the ribbon, you see a classroom, thanks for using it. But then I sat down with the teachers and tried to understand what they do in a school in Kenya. I'd never been to Kenya before, I'd never been to Africa before. Uh, at that point I'd only really been to India once to the fancy high tech areas. And what I discovered horrified me. Half the teachers were unqualified. The schools had no books at all. They had no paper to write on. Basically, they painted one wall black and they wrote on the blackboard. And the kids repeated what the teacher said. Now, you're probably familiar with this. Rural schools in India aren't that different in some cases. I happened to visit Kibera. Kibera is a bit like your slums, you know, your little blue plastic slums. It's about a million to two million people sitting just outside Nairobi that not many people hear about because it isn't very sexy for the tourism, tourist industry. But nonetheless, this is where the people from my area went to, the Luos, if they didn't succeed at home. So what I realised is I didn't want the kids to have the only choice to go and live in the slums, which is what most men are doing. And also a third of them were orphans because the parents weren't very educated. So typically they end up making children early to be polite. Unfortunately, the men are promiscuous, in particular. AIDS is prevalent, the parents die early. We have orphans, and this repeats cycle after cycle after cycle. Didn't seem ideal to me. Meanwhile, I had one of these things. This is a Kindle, battery life two months. It has 3G built into it. Amazon have deals with 70 countries, so that I don't pay any more for the data. I just use it. And so every morning my newspaper would arrive at 6 in the morning, I'd read my newspaper and get on with the day. Wherever I went in Kenya, unlike India, 3G worked. So even in savannas, 3G worked. So I thought, well, you know, maybe this could have something to do with education. So essentially I was looking at schooling and saying, well, we feed the kids one meal a day, sadly. You know, we have school buildings, we provide writing materials, but I really want to understand what happened after the kids left school. <coughs> I was travelling with school teachers from England. They have sort of partner relationships with the schools out in Kenya. Uh, they go at their own time, they go and visit the schools, and they go and sort of talk to the teachers, talk to the kids, try and build up relationships. And they basically said to me, you're wasting your time. This technology isn't what the kids need, they need good food. Well, we're already paying for that. You know, we're trying that. We need classrooms. Again, doing all these things. And so the challenge was, what else could we do, even though I had so much inertia against me? And this nice little quote, I'm not sure the exact wording of it, is if an old expert like me, I'm 50, tells you something can't be done, they're probably wrong. If they tell you it can be done, they probably can. So in other words, it's worth just trying things. And typically someone younger than me will find the answer out if I can't. The theme of this conference is action precedes clarity. And this is very much how I had to start. I knew nothing about the Kenyan education system. 
I didn't really know much about teaching. I'm a teacher, I'm a computer geek. Um, I work with Amazon, but Amazon has, I think in India you probably have the same with Amazon. You probably need to give your bank account details or credit card details, don't you, to pay for stuff? Well, the last thing I want is my credit card details on Kindles in Africa. Because what happens if the Kindle gets stolen or someone starts going, buy now, buy now, buy now, buy now, and you know, lorry loads of stuff start arriving in Kenya that I'm paying for. So can we do this without credit cards? Would Amazon block the account because they're paying for the data? And they sell these to the English market for people in England. They sell it to people in America for people in America who occasionally go abroad. They don't sell them to have them shipped to Africa and left there. So I just didn't know what would happen here. Uh, the curriculum contents, well, in Kenya, I think they claim four times, the government claimed they digitized the curriculum, but I never saw it. I asked the Ministry of Education, and put it politely, no one would answer my questions. So millions have been spent on this, but there's no evidence that they're doing anything. How do you power a device when there's no power? Well, down here, the little solar panel. This is what I end up doing, solar panels and little batteries and stuff like this. It's a way of providing power for these equipment. But I didn't know this would work at the time. <coughs> One of the problems of giving expensive technology, particularly in poorer regions, is this little thing, which is a tablet, is worth money, isn't it? It can buy food. It can buy drugs. It can buy pretty much most things. It's a convertible currency. So what happens if we give these sort of devices to locations? So we had to find out, could we even get them there and keep them there? And would they be used? Would they work? Would they keep going? A very nice quote from a chap I'm encouraging you to read is Philippa Moore. And his article from about 10, 15 years ago is Five Orders of Ignorance. And zero order of ignorance means I know the answer. One order of ignorance means I know the question, but not the answer. So I know the question is five plus three, but I don't know the answer yet. The second order of ignorance says, I don't know what the questions are that I need to get answered, but I have a framework to get to create the questions that I need answers to. And the last order of ignorance is, I have no clue. I have no framework to create anything. So we're working at the one and two levels of ignorance. Sometimes we know the questions, don't know the answers. Sometimes we don't even know what the questions are that we're trying to answer. I've mentioned I'm 50. I started working at 16, fixing aeroplanes for the military. I did a little bit of training, didn't just say, go boy, fix. But nonetheless, I grew up as an engineer and moved into computing in about 86, 87. And that's where I've stayed ever since. And I've run online businesses for multiple years. I've worked for the big name companies. I still have the free bags and the free jackets. So I've kind of done all this. And I've worked with global users since the 80s. So I thought maybe I could do something based on the skills and the knowledge that I had that would help us in terms of improving the education. And another thing is, I learned that you have to build reliability out of unreliability. Now, TCP is a protocol that all of you use. Every single one of you, when you log on to the hotel Wi-Fi here, is using TCP IP. Your mobile phone's using TCP IP. Now, TCP IP is actually two things. It's TCP here and IP down here, and one lives on top of the other. IP is unreliable. It's a send and hope. You send a packet, you hope it gets to the other end. There's no acknowledgement of IP. TCP builds in reliability. It uses a little number and it says, this is packet number six. Did you get number six? The man at the back standing there. Did you get packet number six? No. No. Okay. Here's packet number six again. He got it. Good. It's a sliding window protocol. Invented in the 60s, I think. And that's how all this stuff that we rely on, that you're sitting there playing with your computers, is based on unreliable technology. So maybe we could design something even if the system was unreliable. The most important thing to stress is I'm like you. I'm nothing that special. I'm not even a good coder. So I'm actually building on the work of lots and lots of volunteers. A few of them get paid a little bit of money from some foundation. But most of us doing this do this free of charge in our own time. And this sort of mess of stuff here is a bunch of content, and we have lots of it. We have Khan Academy. How do you know Khan Academy? Good. Most of you should. It's Sal Khan, uh, an Indian chap living in America who started teaching one of his nieces mathematics after she failed the test. She lives in the south, he lives in the north. How do they talk to each other? They use technology. He 
He ended up putting videos on YouTube, other people found them, he did more videos, more videos, more videos. I think he's done three or four thousand videos so far. And other people joined in and some people translated them. So far, so good. You and I can go to khanacademy.org, watch the videos, teach track of progress, do our little exercises, get some feedback, you do in Spanish, you do in English, even watch it in Telugu these days. What about two thirds of the world who don't have the internet? Hmm. Well, an intern two years ago said, maybe I could do this and put it on a little computer. And after a weekend, his work, basic kind of work, it ends up on a little computer like this. This is called the Raspberry Pi. $40, uh, 3,000 rupees on the SP road in Bangalore. I bought one. $10, okay, $5. Memory card, 64 gigabytes, 3,000 rupees. A battery, $10, $20 if you're rich. Solar panel, $20, $30. 3,000 videos. Wikipedia offline, in English, Telugu, Hindi, etc., etc., etc. All served from here, and 25 concurrent video channels that can be served to people. So we have 25 of you watching videos in parallel from this. For about $100, $150, you buy all the stuff. It's all open source or open content and loose affiliations. And the sort of bucket project's called Rachel. Um, but it's building on the work of Khan Academy Light, the offline Khan Academy, QX, which is the offline Wikipedia reader, and then Apache, which probably most of you know of. And this server, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's a small lightweight server. Right, so basically, what am I doing? I'm actually doing agile techniques. Natural concepts, I'm just applying them to digital education. So I started with monthly iterations. I went out to Kenya, I think I've got a slide on this, um, so I'll go on that in a second, uh, and uh, with retrospectives each time to review and get feedback. I started all this buying second hand equipment from an auction company I happen to work for called eBay. So about $50 per Kindle second hand, start that way, total outlay apart from flights, less than $1,000. So a lot of money for some of us, but affordable. And for those of you working for multinationals, CSR programs, 2% of revenues, $1,000. Most of you can afford this. And maximizing learning through diversity. I really didn't know what would work. So I bought Wi-Fi only Kindles. I bought Kindle keyboards. I bought different batteries. I bought different solar panels. And at first, virtually everything failed. I have so many cheap, crappy, solar battery powered things, stupid things. I could probably create my own nuclear waste centre at home. But never mind. The idea is that we sort of learn to make things reliable. So this is how I started. Six schools out of 20 that um, our charity supported. Gave them one device each. Some of these schools have 200 people, some have 800. Have you tried sharing one piece of technology with 800 people? So what you do is create scarcity. Now it happened the first time I went to Kenya that I went and saw schools and they had sitting in boxes Dell computers, <coughs> petrol den generators. They had the pictures of the shaking hands, never been used, two years. So I did the opposite, start with one device and say to the school, the only thing you do wrong is not use it. We'll take it back if you don't use it. If you do use it, you can give me evidence, then I'll buy another one. And I'll keep doing that until eventually you get to the point that you've got enough, whether enough means, and instead of giving it to you the seventh one, I'll give it to the next school. And we'll start with one there, and we'll build up a little pile here, and when they get to a certain number, we'll do the next school. So I'm now working with 12 schools in Kenya, in two different regions. Uh, they have slightly more tribal problems than India has with the different um, groups. So it was important not just to work with one tribe, because sometimes people say, oh, it's because they are that type of people, or they're that type of people. So I want to make sure we remove those biases from this test. Uh, and we basically had content in Kiswahili, which is one of two national languages, the other national language being English. We found a little bit of content in Lua, which is a local tribal language. And that's kind of how we started. So I needed their involvement. I was in Kenya or with the school for about three days for everything. So I had to get feedback from them remotely. Uh, this is an example of a report. You can see it's written on a second-hand piece of paper that I am it to write on it. Which is fine, you know, it's quite well written, it's a monthly report. And they gave me feedback, and from there we iterated on the project. 
We ended up being able to buy a lot of content in January this year, which feels like about 10 years ago, but we managed to get, I think, three or 400 books for the schools based on the curriculum. And now, they're funding half of it. Because what I wanted to do when I visited them in July was to work out, if someone gives you, do you mind if I just give you a scene? Okay, you can have a Kindle. What do you say? He says thank you. It's not a great surprise to say thank you because he hasn't cost him anything. So, if on the other hand he's the head teacher and he's got to work out whether to make a you know, metal locker for the kids to put their stuff in, whether he's got to take on the kids that are orphans so no one's going to pay the school fees, or whether he's going to pay for firewood, where does the Kindle fit in this hierarchy of needs? So, I wanted to get some idea is it up here? Is it here or is it actually somewhere down here? Which means, you know, if it, someone gives me toys, I'll pick toys, but otherwise they're useless to me. So what I've found now is eight of my schools out of nine have made a contribution. And it's about, I'm trying to think in rupees, looking about 700 rupees. It's not a lot of money, but it's enough and I more than match what they do, and they're now buying books. So a little picture of the schools is actually working with the teachers with Android tablets. Um, and I'll come on to the tablets in a minute. This is a refugee camp unique in the world, the first undergraduate university campus out there. And this is near Somalia. What surprised me here is this refugee camp has been around for 15 years. So you hear about the trouble spots in the world. Well, kids have grown up here and got to university level and they joined at five. What do you do when you're a 20 year old who's lived in a refugee camp all your life? No one wants you. What if you want to teach people? Well, this is an undergraduate campus that's been built there and I went out to help with the technology and ended up giving them a bunch of equipment and little meters. So one thing I wanted to know is would this even survive in 45 degree air temperature in deserts? It still is running by the way. It took six months before I got the feedback but eventually I got in touch with me and said yeah we're still doing it, want to expand the program. And there they have an 800 to 1 ratio between teacher and pupils. So one of the things that we're doing is finding ways to get the, the kids to teach the kids. And that's what I'm doing in India as well as out in uh, Kenya. So I'll tell a little bit of a story about tablets. There's a nice company called Google. They used to pay me as an employee. Well, recently they gave me 150 Nexus 7 tablets. And they said, where do you want them? Well, you haven't shipped to anywhere we've got an office. So I had 75 shipped to India, 60 shipped to Kenya, and 15 ended up in Chile. And what I did, I basically gave them to different schools. Here I've got a couple of projects I'll come on to. I've got two in Chile, one in the capital, which is, you know, you've got to try something in the capital and see what it works like in a big city, and then try it in a small region to see what the differences are. In India, I'm working with a rural school um, out near Chennai, it's about two hours drive away, and I'm working with a group who travel from school to school in Bangalore region. So they basically turn up with the Kindle, there's not the Kindle, the tablets, the Raspberry Pi, the content on, work with the school, come back with them, and go to the next one because the schools haven't got somewhere safe to keep the equipment. And they're all volunteers. So that's the model of it, trying maximising what we're learning, maximising feedback. Um, in Kenya, I'm working with three schools, one's an official school, so the state doesn't recognise it, it's in Kaibiro slums. But it's important to find ways to see what would happen even in this environment. Right, so I've covered this a little bit. This is an example of the Rachel project on an Nexus 7 and the Raspberry Pi. Well, this is the newer Raspberry Pi here, what's called the Model D Plus. What's important about this is it uses a third less power. Now I'm talking about 3 watts and 2 watts. Ah, the first time I came to India, I went to visit one of the state paid for schools for orphans. And I flew in and landed at 4 in the morning, as you do from England. Went straight out of the school on Saturday morning and arrived about 8 a.m. to find there were no adults. The kids actually opened the school with the keys because the adults come by bus and sometimes arrive an hour or two late. They had four classrooms, one of which was empty. But why was it empty? Well, it had computers in it and they hadn't actually used the computers for two years because no one knew what to do with them. They'd just been donated or dumped, I'm not sure what the right word is. Uh, and they were basically playing Windows XP and they were full of viruses. And the power was stolen from the power lines that went across the street. So this is a not very official place. And the computers drew about 200 watts of power, so old computers. That draws two. So I was looking at this, they couldn't turn on more than two computers at once, because otherwise these power lines collapse. So they can move from two computers at once to 20 with less power. 
So it's very simple stuff we're trying to do. Um, these, everything I buy is off the shelf. You can buy most of this in your favourite streets in India, you know, wherever you buy your laptops from and the rest of this. And I proved that by doing this in Bangalore. Uh, I use little four-pack um, power chargers, USB chargers, as a way of maximising the charging of the tablets, etc., etc. So nothing special about the hardware. Trying to use open content and open hardware, experimenting, keeping it simple, and then gathering evidence all the way through, gathering evidence and feedback and iterating and improving. And I'm collaborating and sharing with people around the world. So one of our developers in Mali, Mali is in West Africa. They happen to be suffering from Ebola at the moment. So I'm not going to see him anytime soon because of the travel restrictions. We have another one in North Germany, we have one in Uganda, and these are people who contribute their time to work on these different projects, and we're just trying to tie them all together and collaborate a little bit. I mentioned that I'm not a teacher, so one of the things I do is calibrate my work to make sure I'm not doing something that's destructive or harmful. So I'm working with professional teachers, two of the nations of education, one in Chile, uh, to a less extent in Kenya, which is very hard to work with. Um, I publish everything, and my encouragement is people to copy the ideas, and I read as much as I can. A very good book about schooling, um, particularly in India, is called The Beautiful Tree uh, by Professor Tooley, and he wants to understand why you have private schools, even though the state claims they provide schools. And he found that even the slums, you have private schools. So just trying to understand the whole context of education from an engineering perspective, what actually happens in practice. One of the biggest challenges is teaching teachers. This is me teaching TCPIP to school teachers in rural Kenya. Why the heck am I teaching TCPIP? Because I'm leaving them with Wi-Fi devices. And if you don't know what the, how they talk to each other, then something can go wrong and they can stop using equipment. Uh, this is a teacher actually teaching in Chile. And this is Gautama, who's um, the headmaster of the school near Chennai. Right, a bunch of software. Well, it's pretty simple, code does stuff, and we have a bunch of text and resources that are used to communicate, the user interface communicates. The code kind of makes it all happen. And then we have the content, so things like Wikipedia, the Khan Academy videos, uh, exercises for people to do. It's one thing to sit there pretty dumb and stupid and watch a video. Yep, watch the end of the video. I must have learned everything by now. To actually better practice and do the exercise is going to be useful. And then ebooks, so that, again, people can read and study and practice. And all of this needs to be relevant quality and good enough, whatever good enough means, for the people using it. Um, when I went to Bangalore, speaking to the schools, and they basically said, look, our children need to learn in Canada until about class five. From there, they start learning English, and then they move over to English at yeah, class seven. Now, they were using Edge Ubuntu. Most of you know what Ubuntu is? Anyone know what Ubuntu is? Show of hands? Okay, a couple of you. So Ubuntu is a, a well-packaged version of Linux. It's used very extensively around the world. And they have a version for education called Edubuntu, which has lots of educational um, software on it. Problem is that when they're doing geography, the matter of India is about this big. Now, if you're a child in a city of Pune, how good is the map of India this big for you? Oh, by the way, it's in English, user interface. It's not very good to study compared to having local map, local content, local language. So, trying to solve those problems. Um, right, I'll skip that stuff. A couple of case studies then. Google has this concept called Volunteer Days. It started after I left. But we had a couple of volunteers working on creating automated tests for some of the code base. Uh, Wikimedia, uh, Hackathon in Zurich, which is where I met the Culix team, which is the offline Wikipedia reader, and we've been collaborating together since. Uh, and then there's a very conference here two months ago where I met Naresh. We basically collaborated, and I've got some more details on that. So we had 118 bugs filed during the conference. Um, just over half of those have been fixed by the development team so far. The other ones sometimes are waiting for feedback, or we're not sure what we can do about them. We even got a contribution of an automated test suite, end-to-end, -end, including the Jenkins stuff that ran it. Uh, and everything's public and open source on that URL. Since the conference, it's 10 weeks roughly since I left India and came back to India. Uh, these are all from people I know personally. So we've got 41 translations in French, 30 in Hindi, which is thanks to Naresh. I'll shame him, or praise him, thank you Naresh. Um, Canada, we're doing very well at the moment. More than half the user interface is now translated into Canada. A bit of Polish and a bit of Swahili. 
These people are not programmers, but they do work with computers. So it isn't that hard to get involved in these kind of projects. And that's the total. 522 phrases, 55 JavaScript strings, 577. That's the entire user interface translated. I bumped into this company called um, Signity. I found them in a magazine a couple of weeks ago. Went to meet them yesterday in Hyderabad. And they've taken Khan Academy videos and they've translated or subtitled, sorry, dubbed 250 of them. They also created 165 videos for gaps in the curriculum. So looking at class 10 and said, well, Khan Academy doesn't have something on this subject. The Indian school children need it. So they produce 165 videos. And I hope they won't mind me saying they're just a bunch of techies working in the industry, mainly working for foreign clients. Not that, you know, they're not the top ad ministers or anything like that, but it shows that you can make progress if you want to. And this foundation, I met them in uh, Sri Lanka in Colombo, astounded me. They've created 6,000 videos and they're looking to do 3,000 hours this year, so in the next 12 months. A small group run by a monk from Denmark originally, who happens to be a Linux hacker. Uh, links if you want to look at any more of the stuff. So that's kind of where we are now. Um, I want to go to the future through a couple of perspectives. The commercial side, you, most of you use Facebook. Do you know Facebook Zero? So this is a couple of people are nodding. So Facebook Zero is an agreement with the Airtels, you know, the Vodafones, all these other companies of the world to say any traffic going to Facebook, you won't charge the user. So the user can use Facebook.com for free from just about anywhere in the world. There's a similar project which is Wikipedia Zero. Hopefully you'll get the picture of that. I think that's actually the granddaddy of it, and this is a newer one. And the Google Loon project is where Google creates these little sort of gas filled balloons, sends up to about 18,000 meters. They sort of circumnavigate the globe. Eventually the balloon pops, and it comes down and lands. They work out what's wrong, they send it up again, and they repeat that process. And that provides very low cost, um, similar to satellite based communications around the world. And there's a nice little Google story, it's um, on Wired.com in June this year, and it's an interview with Nick Larry Page, and basically, 12 months ago, Google started this project, the balloons went pop after a day. They went up, they went wrong, the computers failed, and all the rest of this. But within 365 days, they iterated by looking at the problems and learning from them, so the balloons now last 100 days. They go around the globe more than 100 times only in one year, and with a relatively small team, admittedly well funded by Google. But nonetheless, it isn't that hard when you want to. How many of you work with American companies and American software? And then keep your hands up, and European software and companies? Anyone work on stuff from anywhere else in the world? Okay, one. Okay, congratulations. Two. Well, that's a different map of the world. That's a matter of the world by population. So most of you are focused on that little piddly bit of pinkish purple there. And you're missing this rather large bit, this blob of stuff here, which happens to be India and China and the rest of it. So this is where the world population is. So it might be worth focusing on the future as well as the leadership that comes from the West, where thankfully you know, I've had the benefit of working technology for a long time. One of the questions I was asked last time I gave a similar talk is, how can I help? Okay, I'm a techie. Of course, you know, people can buy technology and I'm encouraged to buy pies and try all these things out. But you can translate software, you can localize it. So translate means user interface, turn it into Telugu, or, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how you say it, Maharathi? Maharathi, yes, Maharathi, Hindi, etc. Um, but also then, find local content which means the matters of Pune or Mumbai, or you know, whatever it is. Uh, get local content for geography, history, etc. Don't rely on Will and the Conqueror, which is my history. Um, give me recommendations for apps. I mean, every time I meet people, someone will say to me, you heard about this, have a look at that. Um, productionizing stuff. So taking a Raspberry Pi, which is essentially meant for people to play with, experiment with, and hope not break, but if they break, it's no big deal, to running that in the desert, where no one's going to go back to it for a year sometimes, is a big difference. So helping productionize it, uh, including configurations. Um, how many can download 64 gigabytes comfortably from where you work? 64 gigabytes of data. 
How many of you download 64 gigabytes? Okay, never mind, not many of you. So the image file is a 64 gigabyte image file. In Kenya, I had to drive back from Western Kenya to Nairobi to download content. That was about a six hour drive, because it was faster than trying to download it where I was. So finding ways to chunk the information up so it can be delivered. And I'll ship these, a one terabyte drive. There's about 600 gigs of content on there. This is the cheapest and fastest way of shipping content, but not very scalable. So finding ways to do that sort of thing, electronics would be quite good. We're working on a farming based project. It turns out farmers could also benefit from using technology to look at diseases, look at prices, etc., etc., etc. And lots of projects happening. Imagine just making it available on tablets and stuff. At mobile apps so that kids can actually do the exercises on devices. And I'm hoping the time will come when someone just sends me a little email saying, I heard about what you did, I read your blog, blah, blah, blah. And by the way, I'm now working with 10 schools in wherever it is in the world. And we found a better way of doing blah is blah. So that's when I think this is really going to work. So a couple of examples for you. Um, this is Khan Academy. These are the languages currently supported. You can see Tamil, Telugu, uh, Canada, um, Hindi will be up there. Um, I've asked them to add um, uh, Marathi in there, so hopefully we get that up there soon. This is the user interface. It happens with the Polish, the translated is the main stuff. Green means it's been translated. Uh, blue means it's been translated and someone else has approved it and voted for it. Something that you could do if you're not so sure about what you're doing. And this was someone doing Canva. That was their update about two weeks ago. So one of the things I found is the little SD cards they use, a third of them have failed so far. What tends to happen is a power problem occurs, a little blip or something, someone accidentally pulls a cable out, and you get catastrophic failure. What used to be a 64 gigabyte card is now a dead card. You can't reformat really it, you just throw it in the trash. Trouble is, sometimes that school is two hours from near a city. So we need to find alternatives. Um, of course, providing a spare card is one way, but ultimately we need more engineering solutions. So we also want to reduce the effects of failure. We're now running the web server on the tablet. It's about 23 gigabytes including content that runs on an Android tablet. Um, sometimes schools say, well actually, you know, we've got a campus about this size, and a Wi-Fi, this is very low power Wi-Fi, doesn't reach the school, the other classroom there. So can we connect these two together, please? Or we've got a school network, can we plug your thing into our thing, please? And then looking at alternatives to Pies, I'm trying, a, I think, seven different devices at the moment. Some take SATA drives, like most of your computers have, um, some are powerful so they can run larger classes, etc., etc. And I've mentioned about this packaging deployment of coding content. For those of you who write code, you're probably familiar with Git and GitHub. Yep. So, press the little one button fork. A second later, you've got a copy of the stuff. You hack around with it. If you make some changes to it, you, know, you branch it, you send a pull request back to the original project. The original project takes a pull request and says, OK, I'll apply your changes. Everyone benefits. So do that with what I'm doing. Take the ideas, practice with code, materials, fork it. If you find something you think you can contribute back, send the equivalent of pull requests, you know, in code or in Gmail. Copy the ideas. Uh, and give me feedback both here and afterwards as you start doing this stuff. I'd like us to move from the bias from one point consumption, and this is the sort of old fashioned schooling model, which is where I'm the teacher, I know everything, you're the dumb pupils. Repeat after me A is for apple. A is for apple. Well, there's not much learning involved here, it's just repetition, it's just rote. We can sit someone in front of a TV screen or a video or a DVD. You know, and that can be used for you to learn something, but you're still not practicing what you know. So exercises help us to practice, but we're still doing what someone else defined. We're still doing the exercise that someone else wrote the exercise. So let's get to the point where the kids and the teachers start experimenting and creating and innovating in this area so that I can retire and go home a little bit more often. So my wife does love me, and she would like me home more than I am at the moment. So, Back to the title of my talk. If not now, when would you like to start? If it's not you, there's what, 150 of you here? Who should do this? There are 1.2 billion people in India. Now you could just wait for someone in America to innovate. 
or British guys come over here and do this stuff, but more seriously, I'm sure you can do this. And I hope they'll hear that you'll be saying to me, well, thanks for the project, you know, give me little prompts, but now we're up and running and we're doing this here, and actually it's working quite well, and this didn't quite work. So I'm going to encourage you to do that. Um, at, after the um, panel session, I'll be available if anyone wants to sit down with me and do a bit of pair programming, or if you'd like to sort of say, how do I get started on translations, I'll help you. I'd be surprised if anyone who has a Gmail account or a Facebook account can't be up and running within five minutes. You can prove me wrong. So I'll do that with you. I'm here tomorrow. Um, I'm available. Usual stuff. I'm Julian Hartiet, whatever your favourite Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, blah, blah, blah. And this is kind of what I do. Um, this is the project website. I apologise it's about six months out of date for articles. And this is one of the code projects. Uh, HFC is for Hackers for Charity a loose group of people who are trying to make this stuff happen. And the wiki is where I'm publishing all the ideas um, that we're trying to solve, things like resilience and reliability. Uh, I'll just show you, there are some references and further reading. All the slides will be available. I've been video, I assume the videos will be available online. So I'll take you back to there and I'll hand over to questions and answers. First question is always the hardest. Uh, thanks for the insight, uh, Julian. So, what are the kind of challenges that you faced, uh, particularly in India? Uh, bureaucratic, non bureaucratic? Uh, the first challenge I faced, which I don't think is a real challenge, I think it's one that's the sort of the first argument someone gives me, is Indians are too lazy. They're sort of too bound up with tradition and respecting the elders to change the model. And I don't believe that, but that's the common argument I kept hearing from people. You know, we don't want to do this. Um, we, the people of India, don't want to do this. So I don't think that's true. The challenge to me would be languages. I mean, I don't speak any of them. So I can't review Tamil and say that makes sense or Urdu. Um, of course you can. Uh, Travelling. Uh, I've had made eight flights so far. In the last week or so, I've been crisscrossing the south, uh, which is not what I enjoy doing, but simply just visiting the cities is quite uh, involved. Um, I think there's a whole question of corruption and the schooling system, and uh, you know Modi better than I do, but I do have hope that um, there will be some influence to reduce the corruption. Uh, the teachers, probably, is one of the big problems I saw. Uh, in the state run schools that I visited, half the teachers simply weren't there. And they weren't there for a variety of reasons. Some were smart and simply realized they got paid anyway. So why turn up? Take the money and do something else, you know, go and do a second job. Some of them were best intentions, but they got stuck on their little buses and the bus didn't arrive because the crossover bus wasn't there. Some of them were reassigned by the government to somewhere else. The head teacher didn't necessarily know where, they just weren't there. And the head teacher of one of the schools said, well, actually I'm retiring next month and they're not going to replace me until the next academic year. So I found that of a school where the teacher to pupil ratio was supposed to be close to one, as far as I understand it, every academic year you start with that, it was actually 70 to one. Power is of course a problem. Um, I mean, we're in a central city, we're in a five-star hotel, we've got lots of light in here, but going out into rural schools dealing with power is a problem. Uh, I don't think we have many solar panels, the small ones, so simply getting hold of the equipment is a little bit harder and prices are a little bit more expensive here than buying in Europe. Uh, but I went, that's why I actually went out to Bangalore to the IT street and bought a Raspberry Pi. I was astounded that I found this, um, but it was 3,000 rupees. So I don't think it's that different. Uh, so what I'm looking for is more volunteers. I'll turn the question around and say if some more people in India volunteer and do simple things like the translations at the start, I think we can then start to help much more and reduce some of the problems. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. There's a question over here. No? Okay. Anyone else? Can you hear me? Yeah. 
instead of translating some specific content in local languages, do you think increasing English awareness may help more? Ah, good question. And this is what I'm actually having a fairly live debate with someone at the conference with. So there are several perspectives on being able to master English. And I forget who it is, so I apologize to whoever came up with the idea. There's roughly two categories of English. There's fluency in English, that means you can get a job just about anywhere. You have a lot of job mobility in India and other countries if you're fluent in English, as I think virtually everyone here is, that's why I'm able to speak at this speed. Then you have the English, which is the satisfactory English, but if you go to speak to the people in the funny uniforms here, you know, the sort of the white uniforms or the orange uniforms or the bellboys and the cooks and the chefs and the taxi drivers, they speak enough English to say airport, you know, left, right, thank you, sir, but they're tied into their jobs because they don't speak English fluently. And as we see the younger people go through and the teachers who can't speak English fluently, this could be a limiting factor given that the world is moving towards English. However, and this to me is a big however, I don't want the world to speak English and only English. I'm all four people speaking as many languages as they want, so I speak three or four languages, but European rather than here. But we should never learn in the language of our choice. Why should all the content only be in English, or only in Spanish, or whatever it is? My ideal would be that the individual, whether it's a child this high, or this high, or a child this high, or my parents, because my parents are still alive, they should have to say, well, actually, I'd like to do this in German this time, because I want to practice my German. I want to do this in Hindi. My mother, by the way, speaks Urdu and Hindi and Gujarati. So, you know, if she wants to watch herself to practice her Gujarati, good luck to her. So I like to be able to have alternatives available to people rather than just English. And the nice thing is that if, say, I'm learning maths in grade four or class four, and I'm doing it in Canada, I'm feeling a little bit bold and I want to try it in English, I can go back to the video, but pick English this time. Oh, they're using that word in English, trigonometry instead of whatever it is in Canada. Oh, now I get the few words. Does that make sense? So we can talk later if you agree with me or not. But let's not just have the word, the world's force-fed English, because no one else is willing to help. And ultimately, the only people who will do this, in my view, the only people, is you. Next question. Does the content uh, you already have uh, is in line with uh, the syllabus that the kids go through, the educational syllabus, or it's in uh, the content in itself is, uh, you know, the whole. Uh, I mean, say if somebody is in third standard, a kid who is in the third standard school, and uh, does that content watch uh, what we provide uh, in line with the syllabus of the school? Good question. So does the content match the syllabus in uh, whatever the state is, um, or in the country? So it depends, it's a short answer. If we look at the work of Signity, what they did is they took class 10 in their state, uh, I can't remember, pronounce it exactly, Andhra Pradesh, um, so they're from Hyderabad, which, uh, I think before it was split into two states, um, it was one state, and most children learn intelligence. So they look at the class 10 syllabus for the state, and they identify which videos on Khan Academy suited class 10. They then realize there are a bunch of gaps and um, I think they translated 250 videos and they ended up creating 165, there you go. That's what they did. Now, there's a project with Wikipedia called Wikipedia for Schools, actually done by a charity called SOS Children based in the UK who operate in various countries now. And uh, they basically looked at the whole of Wikipedia, which in English is massive, and said, kids don't need to learn about a bunch of these subjects. So let's pick out stuff that's relevant to the UK curriculum, and they ended up with 6,000 articles, I think it's 12 million words, and a bunch of other content, and that was packaged as a single sort of cohesive mini Wikipedia, and that's now distributed with all these projects. So that's what we've done for English. Um, SOS Children are open sourcing the tool they use to stitch together the curriculum, so that then means that, I'll say anyone, but anyone with the interest and the skills and the background, can then do the equivalent for whatever the state is, or the region, or the country. So that's what's happening. What do we bundle at the moment? Well, if you want the Tamil version of Wikipedia, you get all of it. But because the Tamil, the Hindi, 
and any of the other Indian languages is a relatively small file. If we're looking at less than a gigabyte of content, then it's shippable. And it's not ideal because both the teachers and the parents and the pupils, they all really would like curriculum content for better or for worse. Guess what? Your kids, like my kids, have to go through an examination system. So the schooling system kind of drives us towards examination and curriculum content. I'm all for people learning more broadly than curriculum, but it's important to know what's in the curriculum. So that's one of the challenges, and, and what um, Signature did is they hired a school teacher, someone who'd been teaching in schools, knew the curriculum pretty well, and she basically was very good at helping select the content and say, yeah, this makes sense for class 10, no, we need to do something different for this topic. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks. One last question, and then we're going to jump to the panel. Anyone? Last question. Uh, right over the back there. And um, no, no, we just wait. I'm just going to do this, which is most of you would know what this is. Firefox phone. Bought and snap deal. Second chance of actually buying one. The first one they took too long to deliver. Two thousand rupees. That or the equivalent is getting to the price point that we can buy things. And I think it's snap deal. It's one of your two e-commerce sites is now putting kiosks in the rural villages. I think they're putting about 10,000 out there. And they found that in their trials that the rural users spend almost as much as the city users. I think they're spending about 1,500 rupees per order. So we're getting to the point where parents, parents in rural areas the same as you and I, we want our kids to do well. So when that device comes down to 1,500 rupees, it becomes affordable. Sometimes two or three can get together and buy one. And I don't want to be the one giving out like candy, you know, here's your iPad, here's your this, here's your that. I can't afford it, if nothing else. Ultimately, people, including the parents, and the schools, and the state, need to take responsibility for these projects, not me. Your question. So with this crowdsourced model that, that you have, um, how can a manager, such as myself, who only speaks one language, which um, I think is an American thing, um, how can we contribute? with staff and engineering resources. So someone who can say, right, we want to do a deployment model. If you do Linux, you can help us do deployment modules. Um, we've got a project of peer-to-peer -peer content recognition, which means that if I walk into a place that's got some of my equipment with my little tablet with the content on here, they talk to each other, and this one updates them, and I get usage data on this one. So that, I mean, it's an open source project. Um, it's called Arrow 2. Uh, it doesn't run on Android yet, so someone could develop that, for instance. You could say, and I'm not suggesting, by the way, I'd like to say, you could say, I want to fund something. You know, we've got $1,000 spare. Why don't we fund a team that we trust in school A or school B, somewhere else in the world? Which could be in the Philippines, it could be in the Midwest, for all I know. Uh, and I should stress, I'm an individual, I'm not a charity, I self fund, uh, and that's my way of doing it. So I'm all for people just copying the good bits of this, not building a charity. I've seen too many charities gone wrong where money spent on charity rather than doing the work. So does that help answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Right, so thank you again then. I'm on the panel, so you can ask me questions at the panel. I'm available at dinner time if you want to do hacking, and I'm here tomorrow. Right, thank you. Is it fair to say you were very disappointed after the Selenium conference uh, that we did, we did this talk, we did the hackathon, 